First Corinthians chapter 9 closes with this word, thanks be to God. Second Corinthians chapter 9 closes with this word, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. And uh, we thank God today for the gift of Jesus, the gift of our salvation, and all the good things that we have in the Lord today. Well, we'd better hurry. If you've looked at the outline, you've already diagnosed that. And you're already saying, hey, how's he going to get through this? This is going to require a miracle. How many of you believe with me today that miracles are still happening? Yeah, in fact, every time I conclude a, ser a service, uh, you know, before 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you're rejoicing in a miracle from the Lord. And so today we'll, we'll begin with one verse of Scripture and move quickly into our heavy-duty outline today. Our title this morning, What a Way to Go! What a way to go. We're going to declare this morning that Jesus is the only way, but what a way to go. Yeah, we find these words in John 14, verse 6. Jesus answered his disciples and Philip, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Well, we welcome you this morning to the first Sunday of December. December is Christmas month. And as we begin our celebration of Christmas, we recognize that this month is a, a, a wonderful time of celebration for Christians. Christians will celebrate the birth of the most influential human ever to walk on planet Earth, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Not a, spiritual, uh, not a spiritual figure without historical reality, but Jesus who walked on the earth 2,000 years ago, born as a Jewish young man, uh, as a child, a baby in a manger, and came to this world as God in the flesh. John's gospel will declare that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And this month we celebrate the coming of Jesus to this world. And this is going to be a, a, a month of celebration not only for us as Christians, but for the whole wide world in many ways. Think about this with me today. Rank heathen and rank atheists will celebrate with, with parties and gift giving and all of those kinds of things, all because Jesus of Nazareth changed the world 2,000 years ago. At the heart of our celebration, sometimes buried underneath all of our celebration, is the person of Jesus, the reason for the season. It was Jesus himself who began a discussion with his disciples one day by asking them a couple of questions. Who do people say that I am and who do you say that I am? Now, we would acknowledge this morning it's a whole lot more important to be able to answer the second question than the first question. Everybody says a lot of things, but the most important thing that you can determine in your own life is this. What do you say and what do you believe about Jesus Christ? That's the question we ask today. Who is Jesus of Nazareth? Who was he? What was he? Who is he? Today, every major religion has something to say about Jesus. He was a wise teacher, a holy prophet, a moral leader. But what does the Bible have to say? Today, we're going to take a whirlwind tour through the scriptures to examine that question. And so I invite you to follow along with me and hang on tight, please. Buckle your seat belts as we look to the scriptures at seven chapters about Jesus of Nazareth. We're going to be declaring our faith today as we think about what the scriptures reveal to us about Jesus Christ. We begin with chapter number one, the eager expectation of Jesus. Long before Jesus was born, oh, around 3 B.C., in Bethlehem in Judea, over in the country of Israel, long before Jesus was born, he was expected. In fact, the prophets of the Old Testament spent much of their time predicting the coming of a Messiah, a Savior. The Old Testament is a collection of 39 books written by God-inspired authors over a period of a 1,000 years from 1440 to 30 BC, 430 B.C. for the purpose of revealing 
God, the Old Testament. And the prophetic prowess, historical, historical accuracy, spiritual unity, and validation of the Old Testament by Jesus demonstrate it to be supernatural and authoritative. The Bible, the Old Testament, is a supernatural book. Contained in the Old Testament are hundreds of bold, specific prophecies about the coming of a Savior who would be sent by and from God into human history. And those prophecies were fulfilled in detail in Jesus of Nazareth. Prophecies about his birth, his ministry, his betrayal, his suffering, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension to heaven, all prophesied in the pages of the Old Testament long before Jesus came to this world. We sample some of those prophecies today in the scripture. Isaiah 7, 14 says, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. We see it in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Micah prophesied the coming of a king. Psalm 22 is a prophecy about the sufferings of Jesus. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus quoted this psalm while hanging on the cross. My God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? Isaiah 53 prophesies the suffering of Jesus when the scripture says he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. These are familiar words about Jesus and yet they come prophetically centuries before Jesus ever lived on earth. Psalm 16 verse 9, a prophecy of the resurrection of Jesus. My heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the grave nor will you let your Holy One see decay. David prophesied a thousand years before Jesus that the body of Jesus would not see decay, but that body would be raised again by the power of God. And Psalm 68, verse 18, when you ascended on high, Lord, you led captives in your train, you received gifts from men, even from the rebellious, that you, O Lord, might dwell there. The return of Jesus to heaven, all prophesied in the Old Testament. Of course, we, we could not forget the very first prophecy made in the Old Testament about the coming of Jesus in Genesis 3.15, when at the fall of man, the sin of Adam and Eve, God made a prophecy that there would come a savior who would save mankind from the curse brought upon them by sin. And God prophesied himself and declared that there will come a seed of the woman, a human being will come who will crush the serpent's head even though the serpent would bruise his heel. A prophecy of coming Messiah. And, of course, I, I hate to move beyond this section here this morning without referring to my favorite Christmas prophecy of all from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Unto us a child is given, to us a son is born, and the government shall rest upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of peace of the increase of his government there will be no end and so supernaturally prophetically anciently the old testament predicted and waited for the coming of the messiah now let's think in chapter two about the earlier eternal existence of Jesus, because Jesus would come, and you know, two thousand years ago, he would be born in the, in the manger, born of a virgin, and he would come into this world. But before Jesus was ever born on earth, 
Jesus existed and lived with the heavenly father in heaven. Jesus lived with his heavenly father through eternity past, without beginning, before the creation of the universe, and before he was born into the world, Jesus existed. When Jesus came as God's only begotten son, he came from heaven to earth. He took on flesh, but that was not his beginning. That was a transitioning from heaven to earth. And as such, Jesus was is and always has been God the Son, existing eternally with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit in heaven and in eternity past. We see that in the scriptures, John chapter one, verse one. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Did you know that when God spoke the world into existence and declared, let there be light, Jesus, the Son of God, was there with God, and through Jesus, all things were made. John 16, Jesus declared, I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I am leaving the world and going what? Back to the Father. So Jesus' journey to, to earth was a journey from heaven to earth. And then at the end of his 33 years, after his resurrection from the dead, Jesus ascended back to his original place in heaven. That's why he could pray in John 17, verse 5. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Somebody tell me this morning, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem and moved with his parents eventually up to the little town of Nazareth, somebody tell me what the trade, what the occupation of his earthly father Joseph was. Do you remember? He was a carpenter. He was a carpenter, and Mary, his mother, was a simple carpenter's wife, and as they moved about the little town of, of Nazareth, Jesus grew up in an ordinary, everyday carpenter's home. And yet, as we think about Jesus in his earlier existence, we recognize he came to this world from heaven where he was glorified with the heavenly father. And as he comes to earth, he takes on the most humble form, the form of a servant, the form of a human, Ultimately, he would take on that form so that he could live and die a death for our sins, the earlier eternal existence of Jesus. Chapter number three, let's think about the earthly entrance of Jesus. That's why we celebrate Christmas. We celebrate the coming of Jesus to the world. We call it the Advent season. The word Advent simply means to come near to come near, and when, when Jesus came to this world, he came down to be with us and to be near us, the earthly entrance of Jesus. Jesus made human and placed in Mary's womb by the Holy Spirit was born into this world as the son of God in the flesh, both fully God and fully human. Now don't make the mistake as some people have made in their terminology to say Jesus was half God and half human. No, Jesus was fully God and fully human. And in that fleshly body, Jesus lived as the son of God on earth. And as we think about Jesus coming to this world, we read it in Matthew chapter one, verse 20. Joseph, son of David, said the angel, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Luke 1.35, the angel again says to Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And then John 1.14, and the scripture says, the word became flesh, Jesus, made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Here is Jesus in a human body, fully God, come to this world for the work God has, had assigned him to do. Now, Jesus is on earth now, all right? He's there in Bethlehem as a baby. 
He moves for a little season of time to Egypt with his family because they're running from the king who wants to kill the babies, you know. Eventually, Jesus ends up back in the town of Nazareth where his parents are from, and Jesus begins his earthly life. Jesus lives to be how old? 33 years old. About 30 years of his life, we know almost nothing. We know he was born in the, in the manger and that sort of thing. We know that as a, as a young boy, he got lost in Jerusalem. How many of you know uh, the gospel writers could have picked a more flattering story than that, okay? He got lost in Jerusalem and his parents had to go look for him. They gathered him. And then we know nothing about Jesus until he is 30 years old and begins his earthly ministry. Here is Jesus. He sort of rises onto the scene in front of everybody as this Messiah figure. What do we know about Jesus in his earthly enterprises? Well, we know Jesus lived for 33 years spending most of his life at Galilee and Judea. His last three and a half years were spent in powerful public ministry. You say, well, why did he wait so long? Why didn't he start preaching at 16 years old, you know, and reveal himself as a super kid? Why did Jesus wait till he was 30? We don't know, except that we know the scriptures say a lot about the timing being just right. And at just the right time, Jesus begins to reveal himself to the world. He begins this life of public ministry. What did his earthly life look like? Think about four words with me. In his earthly life, Jesus was, number one, sinless. 1 Peter 2.22 says, he committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. It's critical for us to understand and believe and agree with the reality that when Jesus lived on this earth, he committed no sin. Because as you know, Jesus would close out his life by dying on the cross for what? For our sins. But for him to die in our place for our sins, he had to live a sinless life. Otherwise, he would be dying for his own sins. But the scripture makes it plain. Jesus lived a sinless life. Secondly, the second word, he lived a supernatural life. Mark chapter 4 verse 41 says the disciples on on the Sea of Galilee were terrified. And they asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. So as Jesus moved about in his earthly ministry, he lived a supernatural life. He was a miracle worker. Jesus exercised authority over nature, authority over sickness, authority over demonic powers and supernatural realities. Jesus in human flesh was the son of God who had authority and power over this creation. He was supernatural. The third word about Jesus in his earthly life, life, he was sympathetic. Mark 1.41 said Jesus was filled with compassion. And he reached out his hand and touched the man with leprosy and said, I am willing to heal you. Be clean. And immediately the leprosy left the man. When Jesus lived on earth, he was a sympathetic Jesus. He cared. He loved. He moved, he touched people. He was supernatural and he used his supernatural abilities to help people in this world. He was a sympathetic Lord. The book of Hebrews says he still is a sympathetic Jesus who cares about us, who knows what we are experiencing, who is concerned about what we're going through. Jesus knows, Jesus cares, sympathetic. And the fourth word about Jesus' human life, he was sermonizing. Hmm. I bet Jesus was a more long-winded preacher than yours truly. How, about, how, do, how many of you believe that? Matthew 7, 28 says, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because Jesus taught as one who had authority, not as their teachers of the law. When Jesus spoke, his words were powerful. He was a powerful preacher. 
One of the most, one of the most telling description, descriptions of Jesus' preaching, uh, for me, one of the most enjoyable descriptions comes from the Gospel of Mark. When the Gospel of Mark says, the large crowds listened to Jesus with pleasure. How many of you believe Jesus was a good preacher? Yeah, he was a good preacher. He was a powerful preacher. These are the earthly enterprises of Jesus. And after Jesus lived that powerful life, comes chapter number five. And how many of you can see that a miracle is in place today as the speed of this sermon uh, gets fast? How many of you are, are with me today? Say amen. After Jesus lived that powerful life, he was crucified for the sins of the world. Chapter five, the excruciating execution of Jesus. Think about this with me. At 33 years old, Jesus of Nazareth was rejected, betrayed, tried, and crucified through the combined efforts of the Jewish religious establishment and the Roman military. Their efforts were combined. This is the religious world. This is the political world who combine in their collective efforts to bring Jesus of Nazareth and his life to a close. But the death of Jesus, listen to this, was ultimately the purpose of his coming to this world. And his death would pay the price for the forgiveness of sins for all who would believe in him. Somebody say hallelujah. How many believers in Jesus do we have in the room this morning? Say a good amen. Thank God for the death of Jesus. Would you say amen? Now, if you're like me, you thought about the death of Jesus down through the, the years of your life. I remember many years ago when that movie, The Passion of the Christ, first came out. We loaded up the church bus with our church staff, and we all drove up to Columbia to a movie theater, and we, we watched that movie, The Passion of the Christ. I remember people in that room weeping and crying and becoming emotional at the sight and the scenes of Jesus of Nazareth being crucified. And sometimes we, we think to ourselves, oh, what a horrendous death that was. And, and our hearts just are broken at the way they treated Jesus. But let me tell you something. Jesus came to die and thank God that Jesus died. He paid the price for us to be redeemed and to, save, to be saved. Think about these four words that, as, as they relate to the death of Jesus. One, it was a voluntary death. Jesus said in John 10, 18, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay my life down and I have authority to take it up again. I want you to understand with me this morning, we don't blame the death of Jesus on the Jewish people. We don't blame the death of Jesus on the Romans. We blame the death of Jesus on the great love of God. And Jesus himself died for us as our sacrifice willingly, lovingly. It was a voluntary death. Second, it was a vicious and violent death. Mark 15, 24 says, and they crucified him. Philippians chapter two works through the, the lowering of Jesus as Jesus is in heaven. He laid aside his glory. He humbled himself to become a, a human being. He humbled himself further to, to give himself over to death. He humbled himself even further to die the death of a criminal on a cross, crucified as a common criminal. If you know the gospel stories, you know that on each side of Jesus as he hung on the cross were two criminals, both being crucified for their own crimes and sins against humanity. But Jesus, the spotless, sinless son of God, hanging in the middle, dying as a criminal by his own volition and by his own will. Don't we serve a loving Jesus? A violent and a vicious death. Thirdly, it was a vicarious death. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 says, what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, writes Paul. That Christ died what? For what? For our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried. The word vicarious means he did it for somebody else and we know who the somebody else is, don't we? 
Can anybody here in the room this morning admit with me that you have committed your share of sins? Any, any, anybody want to acknowledge that you have committed your... We have all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but it's Jesus who paid the price on our behalf. And fourthly, the death of Jesus was a victorious death. John 19, 30, when Jesus had received a drink, hanging on the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And the work was done. The work was accomplished. When Jesus died on the cross, listen to me, when Jesus said, it is finished, and drew his last breath and died on the old rugged cross, he died the death and paid the price that would accomplish the ability for every human being who would believe in him to be saved, to be forgiven for their sins, to have their sins removed from them as far as the east is from the west, and to live in the favor and the family of God forever. Hallelujah. Jesus. Everybody say, Jesus did it. He did it. His death was a victorious death. Chapter number six this morning. As we think about Jesus, we think about his eager expectation, his earlier eternal existence, his earthly entrance, his earthly enterprises, his excruciating execution on the cross. Number six, we come to the everlasting exaltation of Jesus. Hmm. The death of Jesus on the cross was not the end. Now, somebody said one time as they were coming and talking to me about, about choosing a church, they said, well, we, we don't, we don't want to go to a church that doesn't have very much scripture. Well, that had an everlasting impact in my ministry, okay? We got a lot of scripture here today, but this is all good. Could you say amen? The death of Jesus Christ on the cross was not the end. After his body lay for three days and three nights in the tomb, Jesus rose from the dead and ascended to heaven. Yes? And from heaven at the Father's right hand, the resurrected and glorified Jesus reigns as King of kings and Lord of lords and serves as Savior to all who will believe in him. Yep. Let's think now about... Oh, 42 words. Uh, let's think about 10, 10 words about the eternal, everlasting exaltation of Jesus. One, he is arisen and alive. Mark 16, 6, the, the, the angel said to the women, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. He, he's arisen and alive. Secondly, he appeared alive, okay? Now, hear me now. It would have been one thing if, if the angel or whoever, whoever it might have been, you know, somebody, somebody might have said, well, what, was that really an angel? It would have been one thing if somebody had said, well, Jesus is not here, he's risen. He, he's here, you're never gonna see him again. That'd be one thing. But Jesus appeared alive. Listen to Acts chapter one, verse three. After his suffering, Jesus showed himself to his disciples and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days. So when Jesus arose from the dead, he appeared and he gave testimony to lots of people about the reality that he had been raised from the dead. Thomas, doubting Thomas, had doubted that. And Thomas had said to the other disciples, unless I see him with my own eyes and put my finger in his hand, how many of you think it's pretty gross for somebody to say, I'm gonna put my finger in, somebody, in the nail hole in somebody's hand? Thomas said, unless I put my hand in his side, unless I do all that, I will not believe, said Thomas until Jesus appeared in the room and showed himself to Thomas and said, here, here you go, Thomas. Here are my hands. Here, here's my side, Thomas. It is I who stand before you. I'm not somebody else. I am the one who died and now I have been raised to life, says Jesus. He appeared alive and he appeared again. First Corinthians 15, five says, he appeared to Peter and then to the 12 he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time. He appeared to James and then to all the apostles. 
The eyewitnesses of the resurrected Jesus go on and on and on. The evidence of his resurrection is powerful. He appeared again and again. And after his resurrection from the dead, after 40 days on earth, Jesus ascended to heaven. Acts 1.9 says, after, he, after Jesus said this, about the power of the Holy Spirit coming, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid them from their, hit him from their side. Here is Jesus, crucified, raised on earth for 40 days and before their eyes on the Mount of Olives, he ascends to the presence of God in heaven, ascended. And he's affirmed and acclaimed. Romans 1, 4 says, through the spirit of holiness, Jesus was declared to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus is Lord. Who else rose? Who else could claim that they had the power to raise themselves from the dead? Jesus Christ is the son of God, raised from the dead, ascended to heaven, affirmed and acclaimed. And he is the almighty one. Hebrews 1, 3 says, after he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. And friends, the reality is this very day, Jesus, the son of the living God, who was born on Christmas 2,000 years ago, is seated at God's right hand with angels and principalities and authorities subject to him. He is the king and the Lord. He reigns today. And Romans chapter 8 says, he is there making intercession for us. He's reigning in heaven, hallelujah, but he has not lost sight of his children. Praise God. And he ever lives to make intercession. He's the almighty one. He is applauded and adored. Revelation 5, 12 says in heaven, they're singing, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And I want, you to, I want you to know this morning, it's not just heaven that's singing the praises of Jesus. We're singing the praises of Jesus right here in this sanctuary on a Sunday morning. He is worthy to be praised right here in this house. Hallelujah. We lift up the name of Jesus, applauded and adored. He's absolving and adopting, forgiving sins, Saving people. Romans 10 says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Jesus is still the Savior today. Ultimately, Jesus is the adjudicating one. Is everybody still awake this morning? Say amen. He is the adjudic. He is the judge. For 2 Timothy 4, 1 says, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead. And in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge, Paul wrote. Jesus has been appointed as judge of the living and the dead. And as we think about the everlasting exaltation of Jesus, we have to remember that the scripture says he's the one who will be appearing again. Acts 1.11, this same Jesus who's been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way as you have seen him go into heaven. Now, friends, how many of you would agree with me this morning that Jesus is something else? Yeah. He is the son of the living God. He is the mighty one. He is the loving savior. He is the one who's going to be returning one day to receive us unto himself. He is the one with whom we'll have the privilege as children of God, as the redeemed of Jesus. We'll have the privilege of living with him in heaven, in his presence forever. Praise God. And so we close this morning with this last chapter, number seven. It's the essentiality of embracing Jesus exclusively. Listen to my opening verse this morning. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. So what do we know about this claim that Jesus makes about being the only way. Well, Jesus declared himself, think quickly with me. Jesus declared himself to be a gift of God's great love given to the whole world 
so that everyone might choose to believe and have eternal life. Who, who among us this morning, you have already made the decision to believe in Jesus, to trust his saving work, and to come into the family of God with Jesus as your Lord and Savior? How many of you have already made that decision this morning? Yeah. Well, this gift of God is available to anyone and everyone who would choose to believe. Two, Jesus declared himself and his work of salvation to be the only access to God and the only access to heaven and eternal life. Here's our opening verse. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Now, perhaps some might be thinking already, well, there are many religions in this world. And I've heard people say, well, all religions ultimately lead to God. That is a lie and a deception from the enemy. Jesus plainly declared, I am the only way. I am the way and the truth and the life. This past week, I, uh, one day, I, I spent some time in, in looking at some, in some antique malls. In fact, I ran into a couple of our te- teenagers at the antique mall yesterday. I was looking, and I, I found at an antique mall up near Columbia this week, I found this large booth of religious art. And most of it, I think, was like Catholic-type of, you know, art pieces and things like that. A lot of, of Jesus art. And here are all these little statues and paintings and all of these things, religious Jesus art. And right in the middle of all that Jesus art was this little fat Buddha sitting there on the (laughs) ground. Can I tell you, I wanted to kick that thing out of the booth. I didn't, because I I don't know how much they had priced on the Buddha. I might have been tempted to buy that Buddha just to get it out of the booth. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Here's all this Jesus and we got a little Buddha squatted down there like a frog. There are many many religions out there, many supposed ways to God, but the reality is Jesus said, I'm the only way. And if you're going to believe Jesus, you can't believe everything else. You you see, Jesus himself declares himself to be mutually exclusive. I'm the only way. So by definition, you can't put Jesus alongside Buddha or anybody else. Jesus won't have it. Are you here? Now all the others might be just fine sitting next to each other on a shelf, but Jesus won't have that. Jesus says, it's me and me alone. It's me and nobody else. Jesus Declared himself and his work of salvation to be the only access to God, the only access to heaven and eternal life. Look at me, friends. I want to say this to you this morning loud and clear. If you want to get to heaven, you've got to go through Jesus. Okay? There's only one heaven. It's the Bible heaven. You've got to go through Jesus. Thirdly, the apostle Peter preached that Jesus is the only source of salvation under heaven. Acts 4.12, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. For the gospel of John declares that receiving and believing in Jesus is the only path to becoming children of God. Here it is, John 1.12. To all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Now, now, I, I want you to pick out, sort out with me this morning, all of these nuances in the scripture, all right? If you, wanna, if you want salvation, it's only through Jesus, okay? If you wanna go to heaven, it's only through Jesus, okay? If you wanna be children of God, it's only through Jesus, if you want to get to the Father, it's only through Jesus. Are you, are you picking up a common thread this morning? So the script, this is not just one proof text somewhere. The scripture is filled with this. And next, the scriptures declare, uh, define the one true living God as the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is no God separate from Jesus and his truth. First Peter 1 Peter 1.3 says, Praise be to the God and Father 
of our Lord Jesus Christ, in his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father. And then 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6 says, For us, there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came. Look up at me, everybody. Look up at me. Now, here's the reality. If you want to talk about God, there is no God apart from Jesus, his son. Lots of ideas in the world about God. Some people refer to God with a big G and some with a little G. I'll never forget attending a prayer breakfast many years ago. I was so aggravated at this prayer. It's supposed to be a Christian prayer breakfast. I attended a prayer breakfast and the speaker got up and speak. You'd recognize her, her, her name. She was the wife of a very famous person who invented the internet. She closed her speech that morning at the prayer breakfast by saying, well, and this was supposed to be a prayer breakfast, you know. She said, well, if you pray, that's a good thing. Whether, whether you pray to a, a, a he, she, or it. That's how she closed the message. How many of you know, I not only wanted to kick the Buddha out of the antique mall, I wanted to kick the speaker out of the prayer breakfast. How many, how many of you know, Pastor Lowell wears hard soul shoes for a reason. I want to kick it all out, kick them all out of here. So disgusting. No, there's no God apart from our Lord Jesus Christ. Next, the apostle John declared that a spirit of antichrist is at work in the world waging spiritual warfare against the true gospel of Jesus Christ. 1 John 4, 3 says, every spirit that does, does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. You say, well, there are a lot of people who don't believe in Jesus. Yes, there's a spirit of Antichrist in the world today as there has been since the beginning. Next, the Apostle Paul was grieved at the presence of so many false religions in the heathen world of his day. Acts 17, 16 says, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. Look at me, look at me. The world we live in today is filled with idols, filled with false religions, filled with things that people worship, filled with all kinds of, of, rea of spiritual so-called realities that are in competition with Jesus Christ. I'm here to tell you this morning, God is grieved that there are so many who are fighting against the only way to him. Bringing confusion and chaos into people's spiritual lives so that they cannot find, they do not find, they will not find the one way that leads to God. Next, the book of Revelation warns that all those whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life will be thrown into the lake of fire, which is the second death, Revelation 20, 15. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, it's thrown into the lake of fire. Next, we're almost done. The psalmist David wrote prophetically in Psalm 2 about the foolishness, futility, and fatality of resisting God's anointed son. Listen to Psalm 2, verse 12. Kiss the son, lest he be angry with you and you'd be destroyed in your way. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are the, all those who take refuge in him. David, David was writing a thousand years before Jesus and declaring, if you don't acknowledge Jesus and honor him as the son of God and the Lord of your life, you are in trouble. Next, the apostle John warned against even entertaining false teachers and their deception. Second John 10, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching of the gospel, do not take him into your house or welcome him. Anyone who welcomes him shares in his wicked work. We can't, listen, Jesus is the only way. We're, not, we're, not, we're never going to hold a symposium here about the potential ways to God. Are you here? No, no, we're never, we're never going to open it up and say, well, let's have everybody from all come with their own thoughts about God. Yeah, friends, there is something about truth that is, uh, that, that is irreconcilable with just entertaining everybody's opinions. Are you hearing? God's opinion is the opinion that matters. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, and then lastly, on our outline this morning, the Bible extends the invitation to believe in Jesus and be saved to the whole wide world and charges Christians to take the good news everywhere. Listen to it, Mark 16, 15. Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Acts 1, 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Acts 16, 31. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. He is patient with you not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And Luke 10, verse 2, Jesus told his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, there, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus is the only way, but what a way to go. Stand together, everybody.